Act of 1965 and the Fair Housing Act of 1968. And although it doesn't get sufficient credit for other legislation, the momentum it created was at least partially responsible for immigration reform and the war on poverty. I believe the most important consequence of the march, it empowered and inspired people at a deep, deeper emotional level than ever before at a moment when anger and frustration threatened both the sense of hope and courage and the courageous nonviolence that had characterized the civil rights movement to that point. Let's take a look. the glory 
glorious opportunity to inject a new dimension of love into the veins of our civilization. Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. You must never be fearful of what you are doing when it is right. Rosa Parks. say, but when I speak, you need to listen because I'm sure it will make a difference. Now, don't worry about as many I have in my pockets. You see, it's my contribution to this world. That's what puts me in the category as a millionaire. And I'm not trying to be arrogant, brothers and sisters. No, I'm not trying to be arrogant, but you see, even, you see, even when I'm in an empty room with my pride, the room is still full to capacity. See, I'm a voice in this country. And yes, I deserve to be heard. I'm a black man black man and do you know how to build this country and for a while the only place yes the only place that allowed me to sit was in the rear of a room or on the back of a bus I'm a black man a black man and every time it's every time you stop at a traffic light do you know what you should think about me well yes my skin is dark it is as dark as the berries that run wild in the fields now that my great grandparents once picked cotton my hands are rough my hands are rough did I not tell you earlier that I built this country I'm a black man a black man, and I'm angry. I'm, I'm angry. I'm so angry that I'm going out to do something good. No, I'm not afraid. I fear absolutely no one. The creator so get out of my way. Yeah, yes, get out of my way if you're not going forward. You say, I ain't got time to be tired. My daughter needs a father. My son needs a role model. And my wife is, my wife needs a man. Didn't I tell you to get out of my way if you're not going forward? There's so many brothers need my help because maybe they're hooked on drugs and there's homeless people that need to be shown just a little bit of love. You better get out of my way if you're not going forward so that I can make the difference. You said, my man, I'm the man. And thank God that I'm a black man with peace and integrity. I just had to get that off my chest, right? I had to get that off my chest. First of all, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Jerome, for, for allowing me to be a part of this. Is, you know, thank you for just calling my name again. You know, a lot of times people come to your house and you don't want to invite them back. <laughs> you, you, know, you know, sometimes when they leave, you're like, okay, this is their last time. <laughs> so it's always a pleasure to be asked back. You know, that, that means a lot to me. Um, how many people here for me with Dr. C.T. Vivian? Okay. Dr. 
Dr. Vivian is an amazing man, right? Amazing man. And uh, I had the luxury of having a conversation with him not too long ago. And um, we were talking about when he was down in Florida, Sanford, Florida, with um, the SCLC. They were protesting the verdict of Trayvon Martin's death. And um, he was down there. And so he was in the car with Jemida Orange and another young man by the name of John Taylor. So they went out to get something to eat. And while they were out getting something to eat, Jamada and, and John Taylor were talking about how beautiful the trees were in Florida, how beautiful these trees were. Uh, and they kept pointing it. And finally, it must have irritated Dr. Vivian. He said, well, those trees don't look that good to me. And just that conversation, immediately when I heard the, the discussion, immediately I knew what he was saying. And here's a piece that's called Those Trees. In the car riding through Alabama on our way to Mississippi, my friends and I, we were talking about everything. While riding, we were enjoying the music on the radio, Marvin Gaye, Sam Cooke, a change is going to come. Some of the songs my friends and I even tried to sing. Great conversation. The topics ranged from politics, religion, money. We even talked about Muhammad Ali being the best athlete of all times. Nothing like a great debate. All we need was some good food, maybe a bottle of wine. Well, as we were riding, we had this incredible view. Now, one of my friends began to talk about the beautiful trees, the leaves, the colors, and the more one friend talked, the more another friend withdrew. The one friend said, look at those maples, that magnolia, that oak, look at that tall wood. And I don't remember who, but someone said, shoot trees like that? They don't always grow in the hood. <coughs> now, my friend who was drawn from the conversation said, I can't take it anymore. And it caught all of us by surprise. We didn't know if he wasn't feeling well. Then we could stop and get him something from the corner store. Finally, he said, those trees, they don't look that good to me. When I look at those trees, that's not what I see. He says, when I look at those trees, I see our bodies that have been lynched and set afire. When I look at those trees, I see a rope thrown across those trees, put around black people's necks, and then pulled up high. When I look at those trees, I see our people tied to that magnolia and beating inches from their lives. When I look at those trees, I see a father that's been hung in the presence of his children and his wife. He says, I don't look at those trees as a place I can take a basket and a blanket and lay up under the stars or a place that I can lean back and read a good book or write my memoirs. He says, when I look at those trees in the fall, the leaves, the colors are turning amber. But what I really see is a tree that just inspired an entire family. And they gather around those trees like we were their recreation. Families coming from far and near to watch like they want spring break or on vacation. When I look at those trees, I can hear the screaming. And then all of a sudden, I don't hear screaming anymore. Another life is gone. Those trees, those trees, they still hurt me down to my core. Those trees, they bring back memories, bad memories. They make me want to try. You know, those trees, they make me ask, why? Those trees took away so many hopes and so many dreams. Yeah, those trees, they had a theme. If those trees could talk, they would say he was innocent. It wasn't even him. But they ignored all of the evidence and made judge and jury in my lens. If those trees could call rose, which names would they say here I hung? Would it be Emmett, Calvin, Henry, the birth of Sandra Van, Nando? Did you all know that's where the song Strange Fruits come from? My friend said, that's not the purpose God created those trees supposed to be chased, caught, and hung like prey. The real purpose of those trees is to provide oxygen, optic oxygen away. Just when I look at those trees on a hot summer day, I wish I could only see them in shade. And instead, when I look at those trees, I see a white man in a robe with sheets on their head. Those trees took mothers from daughters. Fathers from sons. When you all look at those trees, you see beauty. When I see them, I want to run from those trees. The piece is entitled Those Trees. Mm -hmm. and so, you know, it's just, it's just a reminder, and, it, and it's not, I mean, has anything really changed? You know, uh, I always say this, and I say it all the time. Every time I get up to black women, are amazing. You all are. You all are, you know, you, you, you're amazing. You, 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 you've been amazing for not just a short period of time, for a long time. You know, Dr. Dorothy Heights once said, black women seldom do what they want to, but they always do what they have to. Mm -hmm. Dr. Janella Cole once said, you can educate a man, you educate an individual, you educate a woman, you educate a nation. Yusuf Benjikana says she's dipped in chocolate, she's bronzed in elegance, enameled in grace, toasted in beauty, my Lord, she must be a black woman. The door, and, and, and who is it? I think somebody said a woman is like a tea bag. 
You never know how strong she is until you put in hot water. Mm. I mean, amazing. And Alabama is better because of black women. Some of y'all will catch that on the way home. Um, <laughs> there was a, th this, this English professor wrote on the board one day, Jerome, a statement. He asked his students to punctuate. It says, a woman without her man is nothing. A woman without her man is nothing. And all the men, we came in and we punctuated a woman, comma, without her man, comma, is nothing. But all the sisters punctuated this way, a woman, colon, without her, comma, man is nothing. Some of y'all catch that on the way home too. <laughs> so this 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 last piece, and I'll sit on this, sit down on this one. It's uh, is, is talking about an amazing woman, and I think all of us knew this woman. Everybody knew this woman. She was the matriarch of the family. She was the one everyone respected. She didn't solicit a politic for this position. No, she didn't have to be elected. No paperwork needed God appointed her so she didn't have to apply. She earned this title that she wore with pride. She had wisdom that you wouldn't find in a book. She had a faith not easily shook. She didn't attend college, barely completed high school. But just because she didn't have letters in front or behind her name, let me be perfectly clear, Big Mama was nobody's fool. Mm -hmm. What Big Mama could do with three eggs, mm -hmm. some milk and a loaf of bread, would leave you full yet scratching your head. She has so many remedies, she should have been a physician. And if you were down, Big Mama knew just how to make you feel better. Part time, she was a comedian, maybe even a magician. Big Mama could recite the Constitution, National Negro Anthem, and the Girl Scout Oaths. And did you know Big Mama was psychic because she could just look at you and tell if you were lying, <laughs> pregnant, <laughs> or both? <laughs> she took care of her children and she reared so many more. She always knew what was going on in the house, even in the community. She was a classic example of all closed eyes, ain't sleep, even when she snored. She was a glue that kept everything and everyone together. Almost forgot if you got out of line, Big Mom was not above pulling out the lever. But she made us feel good about ourselves and from which we've come. Taught us what food meant to our culture, the tradition of marriage. Even at the family reunion, she even educated us on what the beats meant in the drum. Get y'all here, Big Mama, now. Stop running out of this house, slamming that door. You're going to make my case fall. <laughs> and if you didn't have anyone to play with, Big Mama was not a buzz sitting down with your tea set up outside throwing and catching a ball. I can see Big Mama putting on her dress, her hat, and her gloves, and she's walking to the polls to vote, singing, Ain't going to let nobody turn me around, turn me around, with a hat and a coat. Big Mama's gone now, so many of the values that she stood for. The beliefs that shaped us down to our core. You see, Big Mama would get up and go to church on Sundays and Wednesdays and make sure the whole family attended. And no matter how late you out on that Saturday night, you would get them going to church on Sunday morning. But when Big Mama died, that all ended. Big Mama would help you with your homework and make sure you did the chores around that two-bedroom mansion. We never saw it as a shack. And when Big Mama told you to do something that settled it, you didn't even think about talking back. I mean, because Big Mama could love and reprimand you with the exact same words. Did you hear what I said to you? Baby, did you hear what I said to you? Loud and clear, they were both heard. Big Mama's gone now, so tell me who's in charge, because when we lost Big Mama, we lost more than just a heart. We lost the leadership, a dignity, we lost our pride. Because if Big Mama's still around, no longer with rollers and pajama bottoms and tops, be worn outside. Mm -hmm. Young men will be summoned to pull yeah. up their pants, and don't get me started on what Big Mama said about the way we not dance. Mm -hmm. Did you all know that Big Mama was a banker, a counselor, and a gourmet chef? I know she cleaned white people's houses during the day, but she was also a financial advisor. How is it she put all five of her kids through college, right, creating generational wealth? Big Mama, Medea, Nana, Granite, Gigi, she's gone, but she left us everything we need, a sense of God, family, and community. So now it's time we all plant the seed of Big Mama. So Big Mama would tell you on my way back to the sea, she would say to you all, if you never come face to face with the devil, you and him must be heading in the same direction. <laughs>
Iwayan Mata articulates traditional West African rhythms on the djembe, sangban, kenkeni, dunamba, drums, and sakir. and the bounty 
of our planet. So we perform for you now, Sente from Guinea, West Africa. Wonta bele mawa niki how we are there, wonta bele mawa nagai. Wanna go how we are day, wanna go how we are day, wanna go wanna go how we are day, wanna go how we are day, wanna go. Won't a bele mawa niki how we are day, won't a bele mawa nagai. Won't a bele mawa niki how we are day, won't a bele mawa nagai. Wanna go how we are day.
all enjoying the music that you have presented before you today. I just want to share one thing about African culture that you all are very in tune to, and that is that there is no audience and entertainer, but it's a village, and everyone is a part of the occasion. It's like the art that we get. The art has always been utilitarian. It's something that can be used in everyday life and not just things to be hung on the walls. And so, with that thought, I am going to invite you all to be a part of this performance. <laughs> now, we usually have folk come up and dance with us, but because the space is a little small up here, even though we do this in living rooms and everything, <laughs> We're going to have you to perform with us, to share with us from your seats. Our dancers, Arata and Angelica, are going to show you some movements. And you will do those movements from your seats because you feel good right now, right? Yes. 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 The piece that we're going to do next also comes to us from Guinea, West Africa. It's called Cuckoo. Everyone say Cuckoo. Cuckoo. Cuckoo is a song and dance that comes from Guinea, West Africa, also to celebrate the harvest of the fish. The fishing harvest is very important when you live by the ocean, when there are rivers bountifully rolling through your land. And so that celebration is one that is genuine and typical. And so we will be celebrating the harvest here. And as we do this, we're going to embody what this song means. Cuckoo loosely means, I feel what, ladies? Good. <laughs> OK? So we want you to enjoy Cuckoo with us. Now, to start, I'm going to share a chant. When I say a cuckoo aye, you say aye. A cuckoo aye? Aye. When I say a cuckoo aye, you say aye. A cuckoo aye? Aye. When I say a kuku a ye a mate ya, you say a a ku ku. A kuku a ye a mate ya, a a ku ku. Let's try that all together. A kuku a ye.
or your abilities until we begin to see that there's a greater scheme of things. While I was in my 30s working in the governor's office, I'm a, a workaholic. I used to be, not as much. I'm the first one wherever I work. That's not good. But the governor was like that. Roy Barnes was a lawyer. So back then we didn't have Google. So the lawyer's responsibility was to read five or six newspapers, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and I had to highlight it. Because anything that would be relevant for him, that was a part of my job. He got in about six, so I got in about four. 
to get all of that done. Remember now, no Google and all of that. While I was there, I was weary one day because when you're the first anywhere, you know there's a price to pay. And I was at my office and a lady came in who was the cleaning lady. And she knocked on the door and I got up to give her my trash can. Because little did she know that the very offices, the very courtroom that I cleaned as one of three jobs, the very courtroom I ended up presiding in as a judge. Mm. See, that's why I'm here. I know who God is. And I know where everything is not by accident. I'm coming somewhere. Just hold on with me. I was in, it was incredulous to me that we would call this lady. I had to get it straight. I was the lawyer, so you know, I, could, I ran a law firm. We don't call her by her first name. She had worked there at that Capitol for years. I was weary, 30-something years old, just tired and just under a lot of pressure. And I got up to give it to her, and then she walked back in and she said, Miss Penny. And I said, oh, no, no, you don't have to call me that. She said, and I'll say it in the way she said, I want you to remember this. You here for all of us. It changed my life. It changed my career. It changed everything about who I was. You here for all of us. And don't you ever forget that. Oh, we want to talk about black history. They asked me to talk about making you leaders, but you're already leaders. So then where do we go from here? Is Dr. King's dream relevant? What wakes me up in the morning in the midst of organized chaos? 400 years later, are we really free? Because you can pay a car note and a house note. And we see that many Americans, when that's pulled back, and the covers are pulled back. Middle class is not what it used to be. When government workers were in a bad way, and you, you're shedding tears, my dear. You know why you're doing it? Because I know that you know, like I know, that all of us have a story. That was one of many. You're here because of your story. What we try to do, and we have the majority as African Americans influence bourgeoisie. You've made it into this beautiful tower, mm -hmm. this <laughs> building, the Wells Fargo building on 17th Street in Atlanta. <laughs> but you got a story. Right. And too many of us want to forget where we come from. Mm -hmm. It's easy for me to come up here now and say, well, I went to seminary and I went to Harvard and I finished there and I'm currently in a PhD program now. Then I'm a professor. No, my mother was a single mother who was raped, and I'm that child that she kept. Wow. And in spite of it, what she gave me was Jesus. And the other thing was the value of an education, but she also gave me my blackness. And what I did not know about being black, although she was raped by a white man, I found myself when I went to seminary, I went there looking for God and I found myself. You can't lead until you know who you are. All right. You can't know who you are until you embrace where you came from. Every part of you, the Russell family, they paid a price. You will never know what your daddy had to go through. You'll never know that. You're reaping the rewards. You have an obligation, which I know you know. And you see, I'm an entrepreneur. It ain't no obligation till you got to meet a payroll. <laughs> Not just your own, I'm talking somebody else. That'll man you up and woman you up in a minute when you understand that lives are in your hands. There is an obligation. So your stories, you want to be the best that you can be. I only have a few more minutes to do this thing with you. And it is to embrace who you are and where you came from. It's okay. You, Maya Angelou said you can tell it, but you don't have to tell it all. <laughs> keep the drug use to yourself, how many people you slept with, keep all that to yourself. <laughs> but you have a proud legacy or you wouldn't be here. 
Do you really think I could have gotten to the point where I preached my first sermon at the same pulpit that Dr. King did? From a girl who was working at Georgia State but had to sleep in a car homeless, but finished at the top of my class. But then you still have to deal with the struggle of saying, wait a minute here. I said organized chaos because in the midst of all of this is a bigotry and racism that we've never seen before. 60% of African American males are either in prison, in jail, on probation, or on parole. Mm. Do you understand how serious that is? Mm. Two and three women who have babies will lose those children more than white women. When it was legal discrimination in 1960, the year before I was born, 27% gap in housing when it was legal. Now it's 30% mm. when it's supposed to be illegal. While the current occupant of the White House fuels it. You can't be blind to that anymore. We're suffering in silence because you don't know your story and you don't know your history. <coughs> because even after the Emancipation Proclamation, the 13th Amendment didn't come 258 years later. Embedded in the souls of America is a racism that we don't want to talk about. We get uncomfortable about it. We don't like it. But you see, I'm from the consciousness of James Baldwin. James Baldwin said, let's deal with the ugliness of America so that then we can become the greatest of what we can be. But until we do it, we can't. You have a story. Your grandmother paid a price. You are here because somebody paid a price for you to be here. Mm. <laughs> if that doesn't make you leave, if that doesn't make you get up, don't be weary about what's going on. We've suffered before. Everything's going to shake out just the way it's supposed to. You just hold tight long enough. But not in your presence will you allow discrimination of women and children. You should be appalled at what's going on. And it ought to be making you put to the point where, what am I going to do? So why can't you move? Because you feel stuck. Some of you do. I just preached about this yesterday. Trying to say that that's OK. Everybody doesn't have high energy. And everybody doesn't. So you've been through some things. You put a smile on your face and people don't know what you've been through. But let me say this to you, everybody's got something. <coughs> Whether you're carrying around the guilt of your family, the shame of what you used to be, because you know we don't like forgiving. <laughs> or the consciousness of injustice, where we will see a media that has co-signed to what is going on. Someone who is documented by the Associated Press of lying eight, 9,000 times from the White House. By the way, a White House that we built, that we own. But you take an empire star and emasculate him. He's wrong now, don't get me wrong. Do you see the inequities? So when you have inequities, that's enough to make you get stuck. So then how do you press past it? How do you get to know who you are? You get to know by knowing where you came from. My granddaughter, I now tutor her. She's at Woodward Academy. The child was losing who she was. <laughs> and I was so busy going around the country, Silicon Valley everywhere, doing what I do, obviously. And my granddaughter didn't know who she was. <laughs> Slavery, Grandma, that was what you mean? We were never slaves. We were enslaved. You're using the wrong language. Let's get the language right. So now I tutor her for 20 hours a week. And before we start the tutoring, we pray. And then before that, we have a black history lesson. Because when I was in school, in the government schools, we had black history. Whites, blacks, everybody took it. That's been taken out. There's been a systematic approach of desensitizing you about who you are. That's what's been happening. You get to us, and then we don't see it. Accrediting agencies of all majority individuals taking our historically black colleges one by one. You can come up with $9 million and we still won't let you keep accreditation. Why? After 
for all these years we don't have our own accreditation agency. Why don't we? But that's why I was so excited about coming today. Because <laughs> let me tell you, these people here, this family here, they don't play. And when I say they don't play, what I'm saying is they walk the walk and they talk the talk. They're unapologetically who they are. But you're not. You always assimilate and think you must. And you don't allow anybody to put you down because you love you and you love your people. But the greatest part of this nation, and I think I'm situated much like President Obama, we're about two months apart, but I think all I need is an afro. <laughs> <laughs> Although my students who are mixed always said, you need to run for president. Why do I say it? Because truth prevails. Intellectualism prevails. Stop dumbing down ourselves in order to fit some pattern. You can become unstuck by accepting who you are. I got to the point where I could finally get up and say to the world that, yes, this is where I came from, but I'm the better because of it. So you look at yourself and see what your deficiencies are. You want to grow. Become the, before you can become a CEO or own your own business, become the CEO of your own life. If your personal finances, your life is raggedy, how do you think anybody is going to take notice of you and you get the promotions? Everything is not a hookup. If you work hard enough, I never take no. I got a no from somebody so big, it broke my heart for all the two seconds, and that no from her was the best yes that ever happened to me. Because what it did was it forced me to stop making excuses. We are in America, but let me say, if you travel abroad, you'll find a better place. I am the product of the American dream, but we can do better. But a lot of this we've caused, because one thing, when he came down that escalator, he told us what he was going to do. There was no surprise, but we don't vote. How can you be in Atlanta, Georgia, talking about how you love, I sure do love Dr. King? and you don't vote. I personally register 5,000 people, personally, myself every year. You want to do an African-American awareness? Let's schedule that this company makes their mind up sometime right before that election, and we go all have voter registration. And the person that brings in the most voter registrations, call me up and I'll give you whatever y'all paying me today. I have not checked. <laughs> because when I got the call, yeah. <laughs> I just said, Michael and I, this should look at our Now maybe if we all didn't look alike, it'd be something different. Because <laughs> when I think about what a little girl gets paid just to come up and speak truth, not enough of us are speaking truth. You must show your vulnerability, and it takes nothing for you to do that. A true leader has no problem doing that. Because guess what? If you are doubting anything, I know who I am. But I also know who I'm not, and I know who I don't want to be. Mm -hmm. This country is a good country when we come together. And there are these forces that are trying to divide us. But we divide us. The haves and the have-nots, not talking about Tyler Perry. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. The chasms between those. Do you really care about those who are the least and the lost? I live off of Cascade. I stayed in my neighborhood. I have a church that's in an urban area on purpose. Is it hard? Yes. But I'm concerned about poverty because I came out of poverty. My PhD is going to be dealing with the extreme criminalization of being poor. I'll give you an example. You probably never thought about it. Our bail system is ridiculous. You are innocent until proven guilty. One of the amendments shares that there will be no excessive bail. So I'm innocent. Judge says, this is your bar. I can pay it. The innocent brother can't pay it. He stays in jail if he can't pay it. That's not justice. We have to change that. I'm on a mission. I'm on a mission. And I turned uh, 58 yesterday, or, or whatever, what do you do now? <laughs> <laughs> it's hard. 
because I realized that I have more days behind me than in front. Mm -hmm. And for me, I've gotten all these degrees. How you got a doctorate, master? I got everything. <laughs> because that little girl in her mother's womb did not feel from the beginning of consciousness that she was worthy. Mm -hmm. You want to move forward? A lot of times you don't feel worthy. Mm -hmm. You could do far more. You're not operating the way you could operate in this company. I don't believe that. You're not. You give until you stretch yourself. Until you stretch yourself. You're not doing it for them. You're doing it because you have a character and an integrity that says, I'm about excellence. Mm -hmm. It's never a goal for me. It's the standard. That's how I operate. I operate in excellence. And when you do that, it stretches you. You don't ever worry and look at what anybody else has, right? Because what God has for me, yes. And I'm only better when I can lift someone else up. You're not worried about that. So when you're not worthy, and I know that we, that's, that's that women's empowerment conference stuff. But it's so true whether you're a male and how we paint the picture of the male, African-American male especially. And then let's be honest about this. This is where people say I can run for president. White males are afraid. That's why Donald Trump came into existence. They're afraid. Think about it. They're sowing the seeds of something. There's been white privilege. And I think what happens is they're looking around and they're seeing the browning of America and they don't understand it. But I want to let them know that there's enough room for us because we serve God and the resources are unlimited. But it is in the best interest of those to keep us with the chasms between the haves and the have nots that the resources are somehow limited. And economically speaking, when you look at it from that vernacular, then you're thinking, well, wait, if it's limited, I got to move my sister on the side because there's not enough for us. Mm -hmm. And so we must understand that when manufacturing companies, I'm talking to the business people in here now, we have to do business differently. Technology, we have to deal with that differently now. And if we had done what we were supposed to do as a nation, a capitalistic society, then we would understand that we could answer their concerns because they're valid. And I know you might be saying, well, how are they valid? They're valid because if fear is in anyone, whatever you fear comes to you. The coal mines are not coming back. Manufacturing plants are not coming back. But there's another way to do it with technology that we can train people to feel secure about themselves and therefore they can feel worthy. That's all it's about. At the end of the day, it's about feeling worthy enough to get up to feel like you're unstuck. So you were supposed to give me, I hope you didn't get caught up in the speech, how many more minutes I have left? <laughs> now y'all gonna have to pay me more when I figure out where I'm I thought I only had like a few minutes. Well, I'm gonna wrap it up anyway. I'll wrap it up anyway. I'm, I'm just joking about that. Let me tell you something. Sometimes you just have to find the honor in doing with the gift you have. There's this thing that says, the sacred scripture says it. The world will make room for your gift. I will never be broke. Because I left the spirit of lack a long time ago. I don't see any limitation because I'm humble enough to do anything I have to do to make it work. I cleaned. And so believe it or not, I have three offices, company, you know, I got a whole lot going on. I'm an entrepreneur by nature and they used to always say, I always keep a hustle. I've always been that way, multiple revenue streams. I'm just that kind of sister. You know what I'm talking about? I was the kid uh, in six, uh, let's see, sixth grade. When they gave me money, I went and bought candy. So I could come back to school and sell it. Right? And the reason why I'm like this now is because I li lived in extreme poverty and I made decisions based on that. And once I let that go, I was then free. Because we ask the question, where do we go from here? You are in search of freedom. Why do we start this way? Because I had to start with the truth. Because the truth is the only thing that can make you free. It's uncomfortable sometimes. 
you know, we don't want to talk about race and we don't want to talk about this. And you're concerned about me speaking about the White House because people are concerned for me, but don't be concerned for me. As a judge, I'm used to everything I say being recorded. I don't say what I don't want to say because I'm free. I'm free. And that's what you desire to be. I want you to leave here today. We've heard the incredible Hank Stewart. That brother is real, huh? Yeah. And he is so fabulously chocolate. I just love him. us to be who we are. My mother did go to Houston to give me away. Because in the United States in 1961, only five or seven states recognized interracial marriage. And so a couple came from California. A doctor and his wife was a professor, and they wanted this little girl. And my mother watched on February 23rd, 1961, a Show call, as the world turns. <laughs> Young folk, y'all don't know anything about that. But that was a soap opera. And a lady on there was Nancy Hughes. She had a daughter named Penny Hughes. And my mother saw it as a sign that Penny Hughes on that day lost her child. And my mother changed her mind. And it wasn't always easy. Because I didn't understand a lot and I didn't find out about how I came into who I am until I went on television when the cousins start selling the money. You know how that goes. Mm -hmm. but when I got the call addressing it, I, I was so proud of the life that I'd had, although it has been difficult, because I understand that every piece matters. Mm -hmm. Your father suffered, mm -hmm. mama right there. But do you understand, today is about legacy. And when you close your eyes, did you leave this place better than you found it? Will they remember who you are? Can you be proud and worthy enough to walk in who you are and whose you are? Can you do that today? Where do we go from here? It's anywhere that you want to. Thank you for having me.
so really, and, and, and for all of the speakers, um, Yasmin, for kicking us off um, with the great devotional, thank you and a prayer. Hank is my guy. Hank and I have been friends for a long time and blessed. And we can always welcome you back to the house, Hank. <laughs> so you are always welcome to come back. And we, you always bring message. And I just, and you know, it's interesting listening to Penny and you, so many of the same themes, really about being your best person, self-worth, you know, just, just embracing who you are will make you better for yourself, and it really makes you better for H.J. Russell. Okay. You, can't, you, can't, you can't be all you can be if you're not comfortable with embrace who you are and you know, where we all come from. We all got things in our lives that we deal with, that we've dealt with, we deal with, and, and we have to embrace those and keep moving. And so it, it's, it's just incredible. Sharon, thank you for always for sharing, sharing like you do. And, and, uh, and, and again, the, the, um, the dancers, that was incredible. Wherever, Tasheen, wherever you guys found that, that group, just incredible energy and um, empowerment. So, I mean, I, I, I feel sorry for the people who weren't here. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, <laughs> but, because this message is something that, that, that definitely, it, it should definitely help us get at least through this week. <laughs> the reality of it, I mean, I'll let you, if we really embrace what we heard, there's so many things that really help us just be better in all of our lives, across this workplace, in your personal life, and, and, and you know, everything you do. So I'm just grateful to be able to, to be you're able to support the people who put this together. Obviously, I didn't put it together, but I know they know I support um, this in Jerome, and we, you know, as Penny said, we are, we're, we're a legacy of, of Herman Russell. Without Herman Russell and, and my mother, you know, because I'm glad you, uh, and my mother, who was really, I call her the bedrock yeah, of the Russell family. I mean, without her allowing us to grow and do what we do, we couldn't continue to build on this legacy. And Penny, you're dead on. We still got a lot to do. We can be better. I mean, if we know that. Everybody in this room knows that we can be better at what we do and how we do it. And, mm -hmm. and we, you know, we have so much upside and so much potential there. So thank you for, you know, bringing that message and, and, sharing with us and, and I'm, I'm, just, I'm just grateful for today and I'm grateful you know, to have Jerome here. Um, I wish we had Danae to here too to hold you know, the rest of it and, and um, she's recovering from her knee surgery but hopefully we'll see her later. But um, this has just been awesome. So thank you for all of y'all for taking the time to come out. You know, let's have a beautiful week. Let's, let's embrace this message. Let's not walk out of here and forget this message. There's a lot of powerful impactful things were said here today and a lot of the, the voice, the song, the dance, and the messages were really something that we all need to spend some self-reflection on. So, so thank all of y'all for coming out this morning. Let's have a beautiful week. Um, let's enjoy this, this last week of February and, 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 and just, you know, stay blessed, stay, stay prayerful, and um, continue to, to, find, to find your better self, which will uh, make make you a better person for yourself and for all of us in here. So thank you. Thank you.